a good friend of mine, Chris Ashton, and I were talking about The Last of Us, one of the best games I've ever played, certainly the best story I've ever encountered in a game, and one I thought a lot about. I felt like there was real meaning and subtext in there, which is normally missing from video game stories, even video game stories people really like and hold up as exemplars of the genre. One of the things Chris and I enjoyed doing was talking about all these character moments in the game and how we each responded to them. Close to the end of the game, the main character, Joel, has to attack a hospital to rescue a young girl who's about to be operated on, killed, by a bunch of doctors. You can get her out of there without hurting anyone, but it's hard. That's what Chris did. He was curious how I got through that scenario, and I said, without batting an eye, I killed every single one of them. I just murdered them all immediately. Chris freaked out. How can you do that? These were doctors. There was some question, I think, about how much they knew about what they were doing or they thought they were doing the right thing. But the point is, they were unarmed doctors and you can beat that scenario without killing them. So why did I murder all of them? I shrugged because that's what Joel would do. That's one of the themes of the game, how much of a monster Joel becomes to protect this girl. To me, that's role-playing. That's sort of the platonic ideal of role-playing, and it didn't require me personally to speak in character or do an accent. And I don't think it's meaningfully different than what folks do at the table in a pen and paper RPG. I felt like I knew who Joel was, I had different ways to solve the problem, so I chose to act in the way I thought Joel would. Very different from how I would act. Folks online have developed the habit of referring to people speaking in character or doing a voice as role-playing, which they deem good, and anything else gets labeled metagaming, by which they mean bad. I feel like I know why this is happening. We'll talk about that, but I think this attitude is a mistake and it sends the wrong message. In fact, I think we have several examples in my own games of how you can do an accent and speak in character and have it be pretty low-quality role-playing. Fun. Fun to watch, but not very sophisticated, not very characterful, a gimmick, mostly. When we start out in the hobby, especially if we start when we're teenagers, which is, I think, the perfect time to get into the game, we overwhelmingly tend to play idealized versions of ourselves, the person we think we are or wish we were, us plus plus. It may be somebody very different from you, but different in all the ways you wish you were different. That's normal. It's not something to be worried about or fight against. It's fun. Eventually, though, if you play enough, you may start to get bored of that and branch out into playing other people. And this can be a very subtle but transformative experience because it means you start wondering what other people think. Not what would I do. I know what I would do. What would Joel do? This doesn't happen to everyone. I've played with people, adults, who talk about how they don't like to read fiction because they don't like the experience of thinking someone else's thoughts or feeling their feelings. They don't like empathy, in other words. They consider it weakness. That is a real thing real people have told me in person. So I don't want to hold up role-playing as somehow virtuous. I see that a lot online. People for whom D&D is a hobby and, moreover, a lifestyle. I think I can say that's true of me as well. But because their identity is wrapped up in it, they want to elevate it. It's not just fun. It makes you a better person. Gives you empathy cures baldness. It leads to democracy. Eh. I mean, for some people, sure. Some people sitting around the table with other people telling stories, things can get intense and you can have deeply meaningful revelatory experiences. But it is just as likely, if not more likely, that you'll end up just sitting around rolling dice and fighting dragons and collecting good memories. And there are people out there who've been playing all their adult lives who are bigoted, venal, small-minded. Bad. Bad people play this game too, and no matter how much they play, they don't become good people. So I'm not going to tell you that if you play enough, you will eventually develop empathy and become a better person and it will change your life, but I do think it is possible for one player to be a better role player than another, and I think someone who is not a great role player can, over time, get better at it. And that's what we're going to talk about, and it's going to have a lot to do with character, and mostly what you're going to get is not only my experience as a DM, but also as a writer and a player. But in order to do all of that, we need to define our terms. Rhetoric 101. Let's define our terms. Because we're all using the same words, but we all mean different things. And sometimes one person uses the same term to mean different things. This is not a bug, it is a feature of human language. What is role-playing? 
I've thought a lot about this. I've been thinking about this on and off for about 30 years. And during some of that time, I was being paid to think about it. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's very easy for someone to think hard about something for a long time and consistently come up with the wrong answer. But I don't want folks to think this is just something I came up with 30 seconds ago. Personally, I use the term role playing to mean two basic ideas. I describe them as role playing lowercase r and role playing uppercase r. Lowercase role playing is making decisions about your character in a game with a persistent world where your character improves based on the decisions you made. This is a very broad definition, but I think it works because it does what a good definition should. It includes all the things we agree are RPGs, like D&D and Baldur's Gate and Fallout and Skyrim, and it excludes all the games we agree aren't RPGs, like Super Mario and Minecraft and Rocket League. League of Legends gets close, but your character doesn't exist in a persistent world. The choices you make improve your character only for this match, so it's more akin to a sport. In Minecraft, my gear gets better, but my character never changes. Role playing with a capital R, I think of as the act of making decisions about what a character would do when that character would do something different than what you would do. I know what you would do. What would Joel do? This is why I think someone who's playing D&D, who's just deciding what their character would do is role-playing. That's role-playing. It's not complex, it's not sophisticated, but as far as I'm concerned, that counts. It's just role-playing with a lowercase r. But once you start thinking about what your character would do as distinct from what you would do, now you're role-playing with a capital R. It's more sophisticated, it is a complex process. It requires you to understand the fact that other people are differently motivated than you and think and feel different things from you, which I have learned is not something everyone's interested in. So those are the two different ways I think about role-playing. People like to imagine that video game RPGs are in all ways lower quality role-playing from tabletop games, but I think for a lot of players, especially new players, the act of pushing around their little 3D model in a persistent world and making choices and leveling up and dialogue trees is not meaningfully different from pushing lead and deciding how their character is going to react to this NPC. It's all role-playing just with a lowercase r, which is fine. If we accept that there is lowercase role-playing and uppercase role-playing and that uppercase role-playing is more sophisticated and more meaningful, how do we get from lowercase to uppercase? How do we become better role-players? Well, I think the first and most obvious thing we need to talk about is character. What makes a good character? And once we know that, how do we play them? Just like I think there's two flavors of role-playing, lowercase and uppercase, there are basically two kinds of characters, one-dimensional and three-dimensional. Actually, I guess there's a third, and that's zero-dimensional, no character. In fact, I think that's pretty common. There are lots of people playing zero-dimensional characters. They know what their character looks like, they know their stats, their class and ancestry and their name, and that's it. When you ask that player how their character reacts to something, they don't know. They shrug. I don't know. Maybe they come up with something in order to please you, but it's basically random. They crack jokes, but you're never really sure if it's them joking or their character. Maybe playing this character gives them license to be lewd or casually misanthropic in a way they couldn't get away with at school or work or whatever, but none of that amounts to a character. There's no consistency. That's what folks pejoratively refer to as role-playing, meaning all you're doing is rolling dice. You're not playing a role. We used to call this hack-and-slash role-playing. Those people are still having fun, and there are whole tables out there full of those players who are not particularly interested in being told they're doing it wrong, and I'm not going to tell them that. If that's your style of play, knock yourself out. I worked with an artist a while ago, we became good friends, and I really felt like we had similar experiences in the hobby growing up. Then his mom, cleaning out their old house, finds his copy of this game, Warhammer Quest, and sends it to him. I had never heard of this, and so he busts it out, excited to show it to me. It was basically Descent or Gloomhaven from 30 years ago. It's actually one of the first dungeon-crawling board games, which is to say, D&D without a dungeon master. There are four characters, you pick one, you explore a randomly generated dungeon, kill stuff, get loot, level up, explore the next randomly generated dungeon. No plot, no meaning. I thought it was neat, and he smiled and said, once this game came out, my friends and I stopped playing D&D. This was all we wanted. Wow, that, that blew me away. It meant he and I were very different. Even when I was 16, I recognized that D&D could be a powerful, dramatic tool, but some people just want to roll dice, kill zombies, and level up. Zombicide, very popular game. But like Warhammer Quest or Descent or Gloomhaven, full of zero-dimensional characters, just stats and art. 
that's a zero dimensional character or no character. Often their players are audience members. They like your campaign and the adventure you're weaving, but they are passive consumers of it. Still having fun, I, I love some of these games, but I never think, what would my character do when I'm playing them? So the first step in moving past no dimensions is to give your character one dimension. A one dimensional character is just a character trait. You know, the seven dwarfs. This character is always cheerful. This character is shy. This character is cynical. This is not always a bad thing. A lot of sidekicks in stories are basically one dimensional and that's fine. They're not the main character. A lot of stories you have some Greek chorus character whose job is to contextualize the story for the audience. They're not the hero, they're the point of view character who is usually freaking out and panicking and asking all the questions the audience would ask. So the hero can explain everything and look smart. In that context, being the panicky coward, very one dimensional, is fine. That's not a bad character. It's appropriate in that context. And even with only a single character trait, you can do some amazing stuff. Some great characters are perfectly one dimensional and no problem. Darth Vader is a suit and a voice, and if you see any scene with him in the first two Star Wars movies, you've seen every scene with him. Great character. Heath Ledger's Joker is just an agent of chaos. He never experiences doubt or fear. He's never anything other than what we see the first time we meet him, and I think he's the greatest movie villain of all time. I do not think he will ever be topped. Maybe a better way of saying this is that a one-dimensional character is defined by their one character trait. They don't grow, they don't change. The always cheerful character might have moments when they're not cheerful, but those moments are important because it's a deviation. The always cheerful character might experience a moment of sadness, but that's just something the writer is doing to give a moment meaning. Let the audience know, look how important this is. The always cheerful character just got serious for a second. But then after that, it's back to being always cheerful. We see this in a lot of kids' movies. Still just one dimension, though. One-dimensional characters often don't have wants. They have no motivation except escape, survive, maybe, like, revenge. They shot John Wick's dog. He's going to kill everyone. There's no subtext to that. It's all surface. He doesn't learn anything. He doesn't grow. A lot of classic action heroes, Marty McFly, Indiana Jones, John Wick, they don't grow. They don't change unless maybe they get to a third movie. That's the defining element of a one-dimensional character. They are nothing other than what we see on the surface. And for a lot of fiction, certainly a lot of RPG characters, that's fine, easy to play, but limiting. We'll talk about that in a minute. A one-dimensional character can have an accent, can have a flamboyant, entertaining personality, but that doesn't mean they have depth. A lot of the characters we see on D&D streams seem one-dimensional to me, including streams I've been on, including my own characters. Morag, my character in Phil's game, is fun to play, fun to watch if the comments we got are any indication. Morag, Yeastnor, Dagmar, all fun to play, fun to watch, but none of them are complex characters. They don't even really talk to each other. They bark. Barks are those exclamations video game characters make when you walk past them. Typically one line long, not a back and forth. Those exclamations can be characterful, they can be informative, but they lack substance and meaning. I watched Tom playing Dagmar struggle because he'd committed to this idea that his character was basically dwarf Quint. But there were times when he wanted to express an idea in character and couldn't figure out how Quint would do it. Doing the voice, very entertaining, often limiting. You start to get into what I consider depth and meaning once you have a three-dimensional character. A three-dimensional character experiences doubt, has self-awareness. A three-dimensional character thinks things they do not say. When a three-dimensional character acts, that action often comes out of an internal struggle. A three-dimensional character holds conflicting values and must overcome that conflict, make a decision, and act. Just like a good campaign has a central conflict through which we create drama, a three-dimensional character has an inner conflict which lets us create drama with just that one character. I want to do this, but I can't do that. This self-reflection, capacity for doubt, internal unspoken monologue, and inner conflict makes a three-dimensional character real. Real people hold conflicting opinions. They doubt. They struggle. That realness is what gives a three-dimensional character's struggle meaning. It's what lifts fiction into art. Because we, watching these other people, learn something about ourselves. And this is the point of art. Morag not a three-dimensional character. She has a backstory. There's a reason she behaves the way she does and wants the things she wants, but she's just a cackle. Yeast nor is just an accent and a catchphrase. Bloody hell. Contrast this with Marcellus Scipio, an NPC in the Chain of Acheron game. 
Marcellus is a young man, he's probably 20 or 21, he's the scion of a noble family studying at a prestigious university abroad, and he plans to have a good time doing it. He's been grandfathered, literally, into a secret society, the Sapphire Sky. They are a good organization, and he's incredibly proud to belong and continue the family tradition. But he's also a huge fan of the chain of Acheron. He idolizes them the way you might follow a sports team. It was Marcellus's idea for the Sapphire Sky to use these mercenaries to help them stop Ajax, the villain of my campaign. At one point, Marcellus watched Tom's character Boots, the chain of Acheron's lieutenant, debrief the commander of the Sapphire Sky on everything that's been going on in Ringwell. And if all these proper nouns are overwhelming because you haven't been following my campaign, I do not blame you. Just stick around, it's about to make sense. Boots basically told the Sapphire Sky everything. Watching this, Marcellus thought, this is a mistake. If he keeps this up, Boots will eventually tell my commander something, I don't know what, that will pit us, the Sapphire Sky, against the chain of Acheron. The reason we're using them is because they can do awful things we could never do. They can't tell us everything. This created an internal conflict within Marcellus. He likes the chain, but he belongs to the Sapphire Sky. He cannot serve two masters. So on their way back, in a moment alone, Marcellus stops Boots and says, be careful how much you tell the Vile Silencer. And I guess that goes for me too. It was just a moment, two sentences, but I thought that was high quality role playing. He was telling Boots, we are alike and we like each other, but we are not the same. We work for two very different organizations that are only temporarily aligned. If you tell me everything, you may say something that I have to tell my masters about. I was taking Marcellus's internal conflict and contextualizing it in dialogue. That wasn't something I planned on or wrote down. I just made it up. I thought it was what Marcellus would say. I knew who Marcellus Scipio was. I knew what motivated him. Because he's a man of honor, he tells Boots, maybe keep some stuff to yourself. The stuff we might have to use against you if circumstances change. I wasn't doing an accent or any particular manner or mode of speech. It wasn't anything particularly flashing or entertaining, but it had meaning. It felt real. I don't think role playing gets much better than that. It even had subtext. So hopefully we've gotten this far without anybody feeling attacked. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with a zero dimensional character, no character, if that's your style of play. A one dimensional character with a single character trait and maybe a voice you can do is fun, very flashy, very entertaining for an audience. Nothing wrong with that. My own character Morag is that. But less flashy, more meaningful is the three dimensional character. How do we get there? How do we get from a voice and an attitude to meaning and subtext? Well, we think about motivation. When folks want to make fun of acting and how pretentious an actor can be, they say, what's my motivation? And so that phrase passed into our cultural lexicon as an absurdity. But this is a critical tool anyone can use when making a character. As a writer, it's something I think about all the time. What does this character want? What does the protagonist want? It's a critical tool in understanding our characters enough to inhabit them and roleplay them. In my first novel, the main character starts the book by repeatedly turning down an assignment until something in his life changes. He rescues a young girl he didn't expect to. I was as surprised as he was, and he finds himself saying yes to this job because he doesn't want to disappoint her. That's his motivation. He's not just living for himself anymore. When he was, he wasn't really living. He's seeing himself through someone else's eyes, and he's at a stage in his life where other men are fathers, and now there's a young girl depending on him, and he wants to be a role model for her. He's not even really able to articulate it. He doesn't understand why he's doing what he's doing. At one point, he gets close to it, and he says, I don't want to disappoint, but then he backs away from it. He's afraid of the responsibility and literally can't finish the sentence. He just says, anyone. Even he doesn't know what he means. I didn't spend hours on that line. I just wrote it in the moment. I felt it. I felt like this is what Hayden would say. I felt like he wouldn't really know why he was doing this. He doesn't understand his own motivation. Was what I was doing as a writer any different than what we do as role players? Was it any different than what I did with Marcellus Scipio? This is what I mean when I say I can just be this character. I can invent their reaction to almost anything. What I'm really saying is I know what motivates them. There's more to character than that. Some characters are meek, some are aggressive, some are clever, some are dull, some are funny, some are serious. But often, not always, often those characteristics come out of their motivation. What motivates Frodo? 
Well, he wants to destroy the ring. That's pretty clear. It's a good motivation for the Lord of the Rings, since that entire series is about the ring. And this can be a fine motivation for a player character in a game where the entire thing is about the MacGuffin. There's a danger, though, that if you pick a motivation like that, it might resolve before the end of the campaign. I want to find my father. Okay, what are you going to do if that happens when you're third level? Now what? You might have another six levels of play left in the game. But if your GM agrees that your game is going to be about finding your father, you know, Apocalypse Now, Into the Jungle, Find Colonel Kurtz, that's a tremendous hook for an adventure, maybe even a short campaign, then that's a perfectly fine motivation. I think Frodo's motivation is deeper than just destroy the ring. This is what writers and critics mean by subtext. There's what he's saying, destroy the ring, but then there's what he's talking about, the why. What's the real, underlying, unspoken motivation? Why does he want to destroy the ring? Well, I think it's because he wants to go back to the way things were before. He wants to go back to before the birthday party when Bilbo was still around. That was an Edenic existence. Remember the Tom Bombadil video? Back then, he lived an idyllic life. No knowledge of good or evil or life or death. The world of opposites was outside the Shire. Even time seemed suspended. Bilbo, thanks to the ring, never seemed to age. That's the subtext. Of course he wants to return to that time, and while he never says, I am doing this because I hope we can all go back to the Shire and the way things were, he knows that's not possible, but he routinely goes back to Bilbo in his mind, because Bilbo represents that Edenic past. Then, after what is almost literally a soul-destroying experience, he succeeds. The ring is destroyed. Now what? Well, he discovers he can't go home. I mean, he can literally return to the Shire, but he can't live there. He can't be there. And if he can't be there, he can't be anywhere. He can no longer function as a person. He can't relate to people. No one can relate to him. And there isn't one thing, one moment, that caused Frodo to feel that way. He was ground down relentlessly over weeks and months, just like the soldiers at the Somme or Verdun or any one of a hundred battles between 1914 and 1918. So, in the end, he... Well, he leaves the world. In a very genteel manner, Tolkien, a Catholic, allows Frodo to check out, to journey into the West and arrive in Valinor, which isn't technically heaven, but it's close enough. That's, that's remarkable. Tolkien is saying to all his friends in college, all the kids he went to war with and who came back unable to function, it's okay. I get it. Some things can't be endured. That is a hell of a motivation. Great for us as authors, the character who is driven to accomplish a task that will destroy him in the process. And toward the end, he realizes that he won't survive. Even if he succeeds, all he's doing is giving everyone else a chance to go back to a normal life. Great motivation. Great character arc. So we have the motivation spoken clearly. Destroy the ring. And the subtext. The meaning never spoken. Because I want to go back to the way things were. What's Luke Skywalker's motivation? And is there an unspoken subtext? Well, he wants to get off this rock and see the world. At face value, that's his motivation. But given the chance, he says, no, he rejects the quest. You know, we object to the player who rejects the quest, and that's reasonable. We got a game to play. What are you doing? But rejecting the quest is classic storytelling. I think it's perfectly reasonable for your character to reject the quest for a reason. I can't go rescue the blacksmith's children. I've got a sick grandmother to care for. All right, well, the goblins just burned down your grandmother's house on their way out of town. Now what? That's, that's extreme, but you get the idea. A character who can give the GM a reason why they can't go, and it needs to be a certain kind of reason, it needs to be solvable, that's perfectly good storytelling. Luke rejects the quest because he has responsibility, and this is one of the things that makes him a hero. He wants to do the right thing. He can't just break his promise to his uncle and his aunt and abandon them. He's honorable and responsible, so we approve. He's fulfilling his societal obligations, and we approve of that, but gosh, we also wanted to go on the adventure, don't we? So George Lucas roasts his aunt and uncle and shows Luke their smoking corpses and says, now what? We wanted Luke to go on the adventure, but we didn't want him to do it for abstract or callous reasons. I want to see the galaxy. That's shallow. I want to stop the empire. That's abstract. But those stormtroopers killed my surrogate parents and I saw their smoking corpses. Now it's personal. Now Luke is well motivated, and now we are allowed to approve of him going on the quest. What motivates Luke? Well, he wants to save the princess. Remember the video on verbs? Destroy the ring. Save the princess. Great motivations. But why does Luke want to save the princess? What is the subtext he feels but never says, maybe never even really thinks to himself? Because she represents everything Tatooine is not. 
He wants to get off this rock. He wants to see the galaxy. He wants to be a pilot like Biggs, the cool kid. He wants to join the rebellion, fight the empire. He wants to matter. That's what this all boils down to. He wants to matter. He wants to make a difference and more. He wants to be seen making a difference. He wants people to know he made a difference. He wants glory. He never says it. He never says, I want to save the galaxy and have the princess of the universe pin a medal on me and maybe wink at me in a sufficiently chaste but yet suggestive manner. It would be extreme hubris to say that, and then we wouldn't like him anymore. But that's what he gets. That's literally what he gets. And when you sum up all the language Luke uses about how far away his farm is from everything interesting, how he hates the Empire, wants to join the Rebellion, wants to be a pilot, that's what it all boils down to. He wants what lots of kids who signed up for World War I and World War II wanted, glory. He wants to come back with medals pinned on him. War is now seen as apocalyptic, but for most of human history it was seen as a great adventure. This is now no longer fashionable, we no longer use this language, but I bet there are still tons of kids everywhere who feel like wherever they grew up is nowhere, and if they stay, they'll be nothing. And they want to go somewhere, because if they do, they'll be somebody. They want to matter. Luke wants to go and come back a man. To Luke, this is probably what manhood is about. Obi-Wan is just a sweet old man, until Luke finds out he used to be Toshiro Mifune, a badass warrior samurai general. You fought in the Clone Wars? Now, Obi-Wan is someone. A man, an adult, someone to look up to. Great motivation. I want to get out of this dead-end backwater village, and I want to save a beautiful dragon from a ravening princess. The unspoken subtext? I want to matter. I want to be someone. I don't want to spend 70 years precipitating water vapor out of the atmosphere. I want people to know who I am. Great motivation for a hero. That's one of the first things you learn in a screenwriting class. You start off doing scene work, and your teacher says, this is good, but have you done your subtext work? By which they mean they're arguing about how he didn't get the groceries on the way home, but the unspoken subtext is she hasn't been able to find a job and she feels useless. We now have some language we can use to talk about different characters and different degrees of role-playing. We have role-playing with a lowercase r, in which we're just making choices for our character. We have role-playing with an uppercase r, where those choices are different than what we would do, which requires understanding that the character we're playing is a different person. We have zero-dimensional characters who are just a name and a look and a collection of stats, and we have one-dimensional characters with a personality trait and maybe a fun voice to do. And we have three-dimensional characters with motivation and subtext and inner conflict, who seem real and whose choices have meaning. And while none of these are bad, and each of them is appropriate for some groups and some players at different times, there are definitely DMs out there who wish their players would do the voice, or who wish their players would do their subtext work. And what they say is, I wish my players would roleplay more, or at all. Well, I think they probably are already roleplaying. You wish their roleplaying had more character and meaning. This is always dangerous to me because it smacks of, I wish my players would stop having fun their way and have fun the way I want them to. But if you want to roleplay better, it starts with understanding your character's motivation, which we just talked about. What does the character want? Motivation. And why do they want it? Subtext. Obviously, backstory can help here, but that's a subject so complex it deserves its own video. Apart from developing motivation and subtext, what can we as dungeon masters do to encourage our players to roleplay more? Well, there are some tricks that can work as long as we remember that the player may be perfectly happy playing the way they are and not want to do anymore. The most simple thing you can do is ask your players how their character reacts to something. Players, especially new players, are often passive. It's a new situation and a new game and maybe with new friends. It's up to us to coax them out of their shell. So just ask them. Don't say, how do you react to that? Say, how does Yeastnor or Morag react to that? Players often have a more sophisticated idea of their character than they are able to play. Very common. Making a cool character with a backstory and a motivation, but not being a good enough role player to pull it off. What can be done? Well, if you know the motivation of your player's character, you can ask, what does your character do, in a pointed way. A player describes their character as being concerned with justice and doing the right thing, and someone, maybe an NPC, maybe another PC, is doing something unjust. And if you, the DM, don't do something, this player is just going to sit there and do nothing. They said their character is concerned with justice and doing the right thing, but they're not a very good role player. They don't want to speak up, and they believe, if they do nothing, the scenario will resolve itself. Don't let them. Turn to the player and say, is Ragni going to stand by and let this happen? Maybe the player uses that opportunity to speak in character. Maybe not. But I bet they will say, no, I'm not going to stand by and let this happen. At that point, who knows what happens next? Maybe conflict. Maybe the player will chicken out. But for a moment, they were thinking in terms of what their character would do. And that's how it starts. 
We always tend to say you when we mean your character, but calling out a PC by name can be a very effective way to remind your players they are not their characters. That's why I write down every player and their character's name on a piece of paper, even when I'm a player, so I can call out their character's name when it's their turn. Simple thing makes a difference. Sometimes I challenge my players when they tell me how their character is going to react to something. If I know or believe that this is the player speaking and their character would never do that, I don't say, no, your character would not do that. I say, okay, that's what you would do. What would your character do? And actually, I, I use their proper names. That's what Matt would do. What would Morag do? Using those names makes it personal and specific, and sometimes it works. Another very effective way to get your players out of their shell and maybe get them role-playing more is to create an encounter that is literally just a conversation. Maybe encounter is the wrong word for it. How about interlude? Early in the chain of Acheron game, I read Phil's character's backstory and came up with an encounter just for Sweet. Sweet was a boxer, the local crime boss ordered him to lose a match, and he rebelled. The crime boss was going to kill him, so he had to leave town. That's why he joined the chain. It's now years later, he's the commander, he's on a boat crossing the Bale Sea. One of the sailors recognizes him from his days as a boxer. This NPC, Jasper, I think his name was, just wanted to talk to Sweet. No trick, no hook, just... Hey, I remember you. We boxed on the same card. That's why I say, let's call it an interlude. A an encounter has conflict. Let's have some language for those scenes that are just opportunities for character development. You might even say, this is just an interlude. It's not an encounter. So the player relaxes and isn't waiting for the trick. Let it just be a moment between these two characters and see what happens. I spent my prep time thinking of questions Jasper would ask. The trick to an interlude like this is asking questions that don't have a yes or no answer. Why did you leave town back then? Why did you join the chain? What do you miss about your life back then? What are you going to do next? I mean, after commanding the chain. Asking yes or no questions is okay, but they don't usually lead to conversation, introspection but they can be useful just to get the player talking. And go ahead and have this NPC ask questions you already know the answer to. Remember, the NPC doesn't know everything, and just getting the player to describe the things you both know in character can be great role-playing. It also helps your players role-play more if you put them in situations that can't be solved by fighting. A good aligned NPC has some critical piece of information the heroes need, but this NPC doesn't trust the heroes, or has a good reason to dislike them. Now what? The heroes have to convince this NPC to share their information. That's when you really see who these characters are. What are you going to say to get this NPC to cooperate? No, you can't just make a roll. You have to tell me what your character says, and if it's good, you'll get advantage on the roll. Don't punish them for not role-playing. Reward them for role-playing. Another trick I use, and it works a lot, is when a player asks me a question out of character, I answer in character. You can see sometimes the player doesn't like this. They don't want the burden of responding in character, but I don't let them off the hook. If we're going to have this conversation, it's going to be between two characters. I even do this when the players are debating what to do. They're speaking out of character, but I have an NPC react in character. The players often object. Hang on, we weren't speaking in character. And then I remind them, but your characters have to communicate to each other somehow. They're not telepathic. However you're saying this, this NPC can hear it and has a reaction. My players usually put up with all of this. I am persuading them to react in character, but if I can tell they're not having fun, I lay off. This isn't a science, it's an art. And you have to pay attention to your players and gauge their reaction. As I've said before, role-playing, speaking in character, is a style of play. It's not for everyone. There are ways to get a character to be a better role player, but being a better role player doesn't make you a better player. Me, personally, my favorite players are the ones who treat the world like a real place. They take it seriously, they take notes, and when there's a problem to solve, they don't just look at their character sheet, they think about who they've met and what they've learned. Maybe we can get that wizard we met before to help us. That is my favorite player. Someone who does the voice, that can make it fun for everybody, but for me, it's just a stylistic choice. I don't think... Wow, that accent makes him a better player. However, there are people who think that way. There will always be people who want to play, but can't. Maybe they don't have time, maybe they don't know anyone who plays, or maybe they're surrounded by people who think nerd stuff is dumb. That happens. Before Twitch, those people would buy the books and read them and talk about them online. I, there's no way to know, but I personally think the number of people who want to play but can't 
so they buy the books, read them, and talk about them online, is larger than the pool of people actually playing. In fact, I think historically, going back to the 80s, a lot of online RPG communities were populated by people who wanted to play but couldn't, and forums and bulletin boards were how they scratched that itch. Now, they watch people streaming. This is much better than just reading the RPG books and imagining what the game might be like. You can actually watch people playing, and if the people are fun and charismatic, you will like them and you will feel like you are at the table with them. And this is a pretty good substitute for not being able to play. The problem I've noticed with this is the audience has different goals than either the players or the DM, and those goals are sometimes in opposition with the players. The audience will always primarily want to be entertained. That should not be a controversial statement. The players want to have fun. Entertainment is passive. It's something you consume like a movie or a book. Fun is active. It's something you do. So naturally, the audience prefers situations that are more entertaining. Players prefer situations that are more fun. Sometimes watching people have fun is entertaining. Sometimes it's not. Because the player who does the voice is more entertaining, the audience values them more than the player who does not do the voice but is merely having fun. And because playing a three-dimensional character doesn't require you to do the voice, just be the character and know how they would react, know their motivation and subtext, the audience starts to value simple one-dimensional characters over complex three-dimensional characters. And is that even a little surprising? Most box office smash hits, including some of my favorite movies, are all one-dimensional characters, all surface. The real gut-punch movies that make you think about what it means to be a human being, that might win awards but do they come out on top of the box office? This perfectly natural reaction, the audience prefers being entertained, becomes a problem when the audience goes online to talk about what they like. And then the community online begins to conclude that doing the voice is role-playing and everything else is metagaming. But I do not consider doing the voice particularly high quality role-playing. Even when I'm doing it, Morag, fun to play, fun for the audience, nowhere near as complex as Marcellus Scipio. When I'm playing Marcellus, I'm not doing an accent. His demeanor doesn't change much from mine, but he is very different from me. He's not an outrageous character like Morag, but he's an actual person, much less flashy, less interesting to an audience, but harder to play and more satisfying. Last week, Lars, who was very much not a flashy player, spent like an hour by the clock wrestling with what King would do. I had put him in an impossible situation. The Knight of the Falling Star had to be killed, but killing her would bring the whole city down on them. Conflict. And then there was the subtext. King is the commander of the chain. It's his responsibility to do what's best for the chain. But he's also the neutral good priest of a neutral good god, and when push came to shove, he could not issue the order and have the knight killed. The chain are mercenaries. They have no morality. The reason the Sapphire Sky teamed up with them is because the chain can do awful things that an explicitly good secret order would never do. And when it came down to it, King punted. He did the ethical thing, but he thinks a better commander would have done the bloody, awful, evil, convenient thing, and the chain would be better for it. If a random person had tuned into that moment, they would not have been impressed. They probably wouldn't have noticed anything was going on. Nothing flashy was happening. Slim is a much more flamboyant, interesting character, but King is a real person. We're very lucky with our community. They do pick up on stuff like this, but we still get people, many fewer now that everything's calmed down, who comment on YouTube saying, and this is a quote, I have no business being a DM if I'm not a trained actor. We even get people commenting that the players should all go take improv classes. Why? How did these people come to this absurd conclusion? Because they are audience members who want to be entertained. We've entered a realm where, and I think this is dangerous, where if people aren't speaking in character all the time, including when they're talking to the DM, which is pretty weird, if they try to solve problems out of character, which should be normal, some audience members rebel. The audience want to see Morag solve the problem, not Matt Colville. So I've seen, I've been on streams where the players are basically always doing the voice, even when they're just talking to the DM, asking for clarification. The player is asking, not the character, but the player is doing the voice. For the audience, this is way more entertaining. Do the voice all the time. But those audience members are also part of the online community, and so now we have normal nerds trying to get into the game, and they go online, and they read these discussions, and they conclude because they're new and they don't know any better, that only doing the voice is role-playing. That is a dangerous message. Even doing the voice is good role-playing is a bad message. I think doing the voice is often a gimmick. If you're making decisions about your character, 
that's role playing. If your character's decisions are different from what you would do, that's role playing with a capital R. If that character experiences doubt and has inner conflict with motivation and subtext, that is high quality role playing, no voice required. Doing the voice all the time, I get it. It's hard to get the accent right, and it's harder if you're switching back and forth from the accent to your normal voice, so it's easier to just never drop the accent. But it's weird because I'm here to play D&D with you, my friend, because I like you. You are fun to hang out with. I want to play D&D with you. I do not want to play D&D with your character. That is weird. I've played in games where I liked everyone at the table, but as soon as the game started, everyone was doing the voice, even when they were talking out of character, and I could tell that me, just being me, just not being in character all the time was disruptive. Okay, that's your table. I don't want to change it. You folks have fun, but you're going to have to have fun without me because I want to hang out with you and play D&D with you, not your character. A little character is great, just like some tactical combat is great, but all tactical combat would be, I couldn't even do it. Both have their place. Again, if the folks at your table like to get into character and do the voice the whole time, that's fantastic. I have seen amazing stuff happen in that environment. I'm not saying it's bad. It's not bad, although I think it is sometimes gimmicky. But the audience deciding that doing the voice is best leads very quickly to the community deciding only doing the voice is real. And that's wrong. You're, you're telling people, if you enjoy playing any other way, you're wrong. That's not real role playing. That's metagaming. It's not metagaming. Metagaming is using knowledge your character wouldn't have to gain an unrealistic or unfair advantage. It's not speaking out of character. I have to say this because of the growing consensus that metagaming is any gaming that isn't in character. We can't let the audience decide that what they find entertaining to watch is the best way to play. No. It may make the best stream, sure, completely agree, but at your table, the audience doesn't matter, the players matter. There's another problem. If we reject players planning out of character, if we label that metagaming and require them to always speak and plan in character, then I think we lose some of the most dramatic moments, which are both fun and entertaining. Players need to be able to plan and argue out of character because one of the things they're arguing about is what their character would do. What is the truth in this moment? Taking time to figure that out leads to dramatic outcomes. Think about it. Even TV shows, which are produced on pretty grueling schedules, they spend at least a month on each script. Often several writers work on it. Movies? They work on the script for years. We play D&D for three or four hours. We are expected to improvise our reactions because we believe in this game as a kind of storytelling exercise. But stories are dramatic. If we want dramatic outcomes, we have to give the players time. You are the author of your campaign. You spend hours each week setting up the central tension of the next session. But likewise, your players are the authors of their characters. They must also be given time to invent, author, edit their responses. Otherwise, you lose a lot of drama. Imagine how much less dramatic your favorite show would be if they had to improvise the whole thing. It's the reason I don't really like improv. I cringe and come away thinking it needs a rewrite. So I deliberately gave Lars and the rest of the players a week to basically write that scene between them and the Knight of the Falling Star. And it worked. If we had kept playing without that week, it would have immediately gone to combat. But they spent the week arguing and talking, and these are exactly the same things writers would do. They talked about what was good for the chain, what was good for the mission, what their characters would do. And this is very like writers talking about what's good for the episode versus what's good for the character, what's dramatic versus keeping the pacing flowing. And the result was something extraordinary. Game-changing, probably. We haven't yet seen the repercussions, but stay tuned. People are going to watch this video and not get this far and go online and say, Matt, the writer, wants us to stop being actors and be writers. No, that is, that is very much not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need both and none of it. Giving players time to figure out what their character would do leads to drama. Knowing your character's motivation and subtext so you can improvise their reaction leads to drama. And just sitting around playing, rolling dice and killing zombies is fun. Let's have all three. You don't need to do the voice. It's neat. It's flashy, but it's not the same as actually digging down and knowing your character and just being that person. In fact, I often think doing the voice substitutes for the hard work of knowing your character. And improv doesn't only mean inventing dialogue on the fly. It also means inventing a solution to a problem on the fly. Some of the best advice I've given, it's changed people's games, is that it's okay not to know how your players are going to get out of a situation. It's not your job to get them out of the situation. It's their job. It's your job to listen and be open to good or interesting ideas. Don't be afraid to say no, but also say yes when it's time to say yes. 
I've routinely put my players right in the middle of the no-win scenario, no idea how they'll get out, and they pull a rabbit out of their hat. And everyone at the table is amazed, including them, including me, and the only thing I did was sit back and give them time to argue and plan. It's one of the most astonishing things that can happen at the table, and it is the definition of improv. The players made all that up. All I did was say, yeah, that makes sense. Could fail, though. Give me a roll. That's improv. That's role-playing. That's it, folks. This was the role-playing video. We covered a lot of ground. I wanted to make a video that would encourage the folks who want to role-play more and give them good and useful tools to help them out, but I also wanted to make a video for everyone who feels pressured to play in a way they're not comfortable with. We talked about role-playing with a lowercase r, just deciding what your character would do, and role-playing with an uppercase r, making decisions for a character very different from you. We talked about character and motivation and subtext, about zero-dimensional characters who are just a name and a look and a page of stats, and one-dimensional characters who have some personality, and three-dimensional characters who are complex and have an inner conflict. We talked about ways to get your players to role-play, ask them what their character would do, ask them if their character is going to stand by and do nothing. We talked about answering in character when a player asks out of character. We talked about creating interludes where PC and NPC just have a conversation, and creating scenarios where the players have to solve a problem without fighting. Hopefully in there somewhere was some advice you find useful. When I was starting out in this hobby, I was 15 and already very into the whole acting thing, and my DMs would often reward me with magic items and titles and whatnot. My friends objected, saying it wasn't fair. They were playing the way they liked, I was playing the way I liked. Why was only I being rewarded? They were right. My friend Dave Miles was right, 100%. It made me a better DM. It also ended up getting his character and our party and the entire campaign into an apocalypse, but that's a story for another video. Thanks for watching, everyone. The Kickstarter for Kingdoms, Organizations, and Warfare goes live soon. If you don't want to miss it, there's a link in the doobly-doo to get an alert. If you like this video and you want to get an alert when new videos go up, hit the bell icon down there. I post my session notes each week on our Patreon for folks at the $5 level and above. We have a store with a dope shirt in it and quite a good book I think you'll like. We play D&D Live every Wednesday night. Links for all this in the doobly-doo. I hope to see you there. 7 Pacific until next time. Peace out.